Here we are. And I think we are live. Yep. We are live? Okay. Hello and welcome, uh, warmly welcome to our uh, 21st webinar by the Academy of Space Renaissance International. My name is Sabine Heinz and uh, I'm the person responsible for our webinar series. And on this uh, 1st of September, I'm really happy that you have come to join us. And our today's special guest is Ulrich Köhler. Welcome, Uli. I'm glad that I hear you. Yeah. And uh, he's from the German Aerospace Center DLR, uh, Institute of Planetary Research in Berlin. And today he will speak about uh, the hunt for life on Mars. And if you're okay. talking about uh, the hunt for life, uh, I would like to remember to Frank Drake. Um, Frank Drake is uh, the father of City, and uh, he passed away on the 2nd of September. And uh, this Drake equation here, you can see it on my shirt, uh, mm -hmm. was developed by him. And um, um, yeah, we are talking now about uh, the hunt for life on Mars, and uh, he uh, dedicated his life to the search for life and uh, for intelligent life in, in the universe. And our condolences uh, are for uh, go to his family, uh, to his friends, and his colleagues from City Institute. And uh, talking about life on Mars. Um, Uh, in the last century, uh, it was uh, thought uh, because um, Scaparelli uh, made this um, can Canali uh, on Mars, also Rolls Canali on Mars, and uh, people thought uh, there is uh, intelligent life on Mars. Nowadays, we know better, but um, Yeah, we are really curious to hear, hear from uh, Uli what you will talk us about uh, the life on Mars, uh, the hunt for life on Mars. I also would like to welcome Bernard Foing, our president. Uh, he's on the airport on the way from Strasbourg to Padua. Uh, welcome, Bernard. Hello, so welcome everybody uh, to this uh, Space Renaissance International uh, Webinar. Very, very interesting topic, search or hunt for life on Mars. Uh, by Dr. Uli Keller. And actually, I have uh, quite some good memories uh, with Dr. Keller, uh, as in fact, uh, we have been working together in the Mars Express uh, HRSC team, a resolution so camera team together uh, <laughs> from quite a uh, long time. I think I joined in 95. And uh, he was uh, part of the team with Professor Norkum, Professor Yaoman, and He also developed, uh, in addition to his uh, uh, scientific uh, skills, a uh, great skill to uh, uh, communicate about the science of uh, Mars, planets, uh, and uh, also producing a lot of beautiful uh, uh, data product, uh, movie product uh, that uh, actually we have seen at a number of occasions at the International Second Congress at COSPA. So it's, um, it's uh, so uh, Uli, We call him Uli, he's, a, he's our great uh, uh, friend and colleague uh, uh, from the planetary side. And we are hunting for life, that's true. And uh, now we are also working on ExoMars, uh, on the PanCam camera and other experiments where we search for life for Mars. We are doing also experiments in the laboratory or experiment in analog missions to look at uh, uh, extreme of life on Earth. And in any case, for we Space Renaissance, We are going to bring life, civilian life, civilian uh, human together with their life support system to Mars. So welcome, uh, Uli, and uh, I'm looking forward to hear your talk from the gateway, that's true, uh, towards our uh, great conference that we'll have in the next uh, days in Padova to celebrate 800 years of Padova University anniversary. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> I also, uh, and we also want to bring art to Mars. Um, and I also would like to welcome Adriano Ottino, uh, our vice, uh, one of our vice presidents and former president uh, and founder, uh, one of the founders of Space Renaissance International. Uh, welcome, Adriano. 
Thank you very much, Sabine, and a very welcome to uh, Professor Uri uh, Ulrich Keller. I believe no we... professor, no professor, <laughs> no professor. Okay, <laughs> I, I think we we have met in in, uh, in Berlin in in, in July uh, or. Yes. Yes, we did. Yeah, okay. Um, yes, I would just want to say that uh, this night we will not have our news cast. Uh, our program was uh, jeopardized by the Artemis One uh, launch that was scrubbed two times. And uh, so we, we, uh, we didn't succeed to prepare our, uh, uh, our normal uh, news that we give before these uh, webinars. However, uh, yeah, I can say that there are not so many news to comment about space uh, this week. Uh, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> Artemis One couldn't, couldn't no use it. <laughs> Artemis uh, Starship uh, test uh, Starlink and uh, our upcoming conference in Padova and the yeah. International Astronomical Congress yeah, where yeah, we'll have yeah. a big delegation from uh, Space Renaissance. Yes, okay. So, but this is the future, isn't okay. it? <laughs> Okay. Before we, we, we give you the word, uh, the floor, Ulrich, uh, Uli, uh, I would like to introduce you to our audience. Uh, sure. Ulrich Köhler is a planetary geologist at DLR's uh, Institute of Planetary Research in Berlin. Uh, he studied geology in Munich and spent a year for his diploma thesis at the Universidade Estadual Paulista in Rio Claro in Brazil. Uh, at DLR, uh, DLR, he started 1991 with analysis, analysis of uh, multi multispectral uh, imaging data from NASA's Galileo probe, passing the moon twice and arriving 1995 at the Jovian system, transmitting image data from the Gili Gili Galilean uh, satellites. Sorry, I'm told you, sorry. Uh, 1999, uh, from 1999 to uh, 2000, he was at uh, Brown University Providence uh, on a NASA grant. And returning to DLR, besides the moon, his focus then was Mars, where DLR has a famous high resolution stereo camera in orbit on ESA's Mars Express Orbiter. <clears throat> Ulrich is a coordinator of the Institute's education and public outreach activities. Uli, we are really, really glad that you are here and I'm really keen on listening to your lecture. Um, the stage is yours. You may start sharing your screen. Thank you, thank you. And uh, uh, we go here. So you see a full screen? Yeah. Yes, yes, we see Fine. the full screen. Um, tell me how much time do we have? <clears throat> uh, you have one hour time. If it is longer, uh, we are not bad. Uh, met with you. Uh, I could hear you two hours. And uh, <laughs> afterwards, we will have a discussion. So and I will not stop the discussion until uh, there are no, many quest uh, no more questions. Okay, because, you know, as, as Bernard mentioned, I'm a follower of Gerhard Neukum, and we had to draw Gerhard regularly from the stage. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, but um, uh, I, I know it, but it is really, I, I could hear you uh, hours. Uh, I really like your lectures. Well, so, it will be an hour. It will be an hour. <laughs> Yeah, well, let's go to Mars. And uh, it, it's no secret that Mars is the, the place in the solar system where we look for life most intensively, beside other places too, of course, uh, which are not topic of today's talk, like Jovian satellites, Ganymede and Europa, and like uh, the Saturnian satellites, Enceladus or Titan. Um, <clears throat> Mars, neighboring planet, uh, you mentioned Giovanni Schiaparelli, who, who um, <coughs> observed Mars in this very close opposition, 1877, so intensively that he that the people thought he had discovered Canali, but of course it was no high intelligence that uh, <coughs> built planet-wide networks of, of waterways. So what we see today is uh, the so-called red planet. We will go a little bit into detail what Mars is. I have to mention it, I'm not an uh, astrobiologist. So the knowledge I'm talking here about is not my knowledge. I 
did in research is I'm, as, I, as you mentioned, a classical uh, <clears throat> the geologist who wants to have dirt under the fingernails. And uh, of course, it's not yet possible for astronauts to have this dirt under their fingernails, so to say, but it will come, of course, too. And it all has to do with, with a big, big philosophical um, question mankind is asking itself since thousands of years, whether we are alone on this planet here in the solar system or whether out there, at least in the Milky Way, which we can observe and we have discovered ex extra solar planets, more than 5,000 already, whether there are other planets that are able to sustain life. And you mentioned the late uh, Frank Drake <clears throat> who passed away. And uh, with the famous Drake formula, we, <laughs> we have a tool to, to measure the probability for life in the Milky Way. And it could be anything between one and zero. So 100% or zero percent, which doesn't help us much, much further. But of course, uh, it's the beginning of the investigations. And who has thought 30 years ago that we could investigate extrasolar planets circling other stars? And since 1995, it's possible. And we are now even hunting for stars that are Earth-like. And you got the news last week that the James Webb discovered uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere of one of these extrasolar planets. So there are big, big steps forward. And even though we are getting older with our Mars Express spacecraft, Dana, um, I think we will, we will see the day in our lifetime whether there are other planets like Earth in, in the Milky Way. <clears throat> and perhaps even we find out about life, extinct or extant life on Mars. That's uh, rather trivial, but it's, it's always worth mentioning it that we have a, a planetary system with four Earth-like planets. And um, one of these planets is in a zone we call the habitable zone. And this habitable zone allows water to be liquid, to be gaseous, to be solid. And this is the, the base of our life since more than three and a half billion years on our planet here, which we call the blue planet uh, compared to the red planet. The red planet has the same um, surface area as the continents on, on the Earth, 150 million square kilometers, but it doesn't, it lacks the oceans, of course. No? It's, uh, it's, it's a big difference, and we will see that there was water on Mars, and that's uh, um, solidified. It's, 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 of course, uh, true that we had a lot of water off Mars, which got lost. Some, some is lost to the underground, uh, to the subsurface, and some is lost to space. And Venus, we, had, we don't have to discuss seriously in terms of searching for life, since it's, it's really extremely hot on the surface, 460 degrees Celsius all the time. Um, but there are layers in the atmosphere, about 50 kilometers altitude, where we have moderate temperatures and we, where we have traces of H2O of water. And so there are some scientists who say, why shouldn't it be possible that in these altitudes also we find microorganisms migrating around the planet like on flying carpets. And uh, uh, this will be um, discussed more in 10 years from now, probably because at the end of this decade and the beginning of the next ESA and NASA will send three orbiters and uh, Russia maybe even landers again to Venus to investigate this. Mercury is out of discussion. It's too close to the sun, doesn't have an atmosphere, no chance for life. And so we only can, or we focus these days on this habitable zone and its outer edge where we find Mars. Here again, a, a, a few of, of these four planets. Mars is about half the size of Venus and, and Earth. And uh, so it's not to scale what you see here. And um, you see the big difference with the oceans and the moving continents on Earth, which is very important for life that because we have moderate temperatures due to the plate tectonics system we have on Earth, whereas Venus and Mars are one plate planets, which has implications for the thermal uh, interior and, and the development of the planet as a whole, which is a story of its own. 
you see the <clears throat> some of the numbers. Uh, we, we don't make much in numbers tonight. It's it's more pictures and words, and uh, I hope this makes much things clear as clear as we won't have too many diagrams and words. Um, you have, of course, realized or followed the landing of the Mars 2020 mission, which landed last year the rover Perseverance with the Ingenuity helicopter on Mars in the crater named Jezero. And um, some parts of my talk, of course, are um, looking into this mission because it's the most sophisticated, most advanced mission so far that is looking for life on, on, on this planet. And so we see what the first almost oh, 18 months now, no, not 18, 16 months now, have brought for results and how it's going on. It has a wonderful website for, for the mission and I encourage you to visit this website every now and then because they have really good stories, not only about the mission, but about the people who are behind such a mission and, and all this technology and, and the mission control and all these things. It's really a wonderful website. And the name, of course, Perseverance, uh, we, we didn't have it um, on the screen before the mission, I have to admit. But of course, the, the name is programming that. And it was it was school kids who, who baptized the mission with this name. And of course, uh, NASA and ESA and DLR and all these space agencies are putting a lot of energy and money into uh, perseverance for, for the younger generation. Of course, we want to motivate young people to go into science. It doesn't have necessary to be planetary science, but to make them interested in technology and science and uh, for the selection of their profession when they go out of school and go to the universities, it's important. But there's much going on these days on Mars, which is uh, also due to the fact that it's a planet that it's not too difficult to reach. Uh, Venus and Mercury are more difficult, even though uh, Venus is closer to Earth than Mars, but it's also closer to the sun. And the same is true for Mercury. Think about the um, Epi Colombo mission that's on the way to Mercury and needs seven flybys at, at Mercury until it reaches its final destination and, and won't fall into the sun. So we have as oldest spacecraft orbiting Mars is Mars Odyssey 2001 and uh, our European Mars Express spacecraft, which was launched 2003. And next year we have the 20th birthday of the, of the launch, Bernard. <laughs> so it's 20 years on its way already. And we have the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter who is doing wonderful photography and complementary to Mars Express and Mars Odyssey. They're doing the stamps, the really high resolution stamps, whereas we're doing the global mapping. I just realized a couple of hours ago that we have covered now 98.5 or 4% with stereo images with Mars Express, which is really great. Then we have MAVEN, which is focusing more on the atmosphere of Mars. We have the ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter. The same is true for that. Per first part of the mission of ExoMars program, we have Mars Inside, a geophysical station in uh, the Northern Hemisphere in the Plains with a wonderful French spectrometer who is doing perfectly uh, seismometry. And we will have soon a publication on the big quake on Mars in one of the, I think it's Science Magazine. We have um, um, Perseverance Brother, rover, which is Curiosity, landed 10 years ago, August 2012 on Mars and doing still doing perfectly, or almost perfectly. Then we have uh, strange new players on, on Mars, which is uh, Gina with a Tianwen-1 mission and Alamal, Alamal which is a, <coughs> a mission of the United Arabian Emirates. I will introduce them shortly. And then, of course, Perseverance. Then you see the ExoMars. Rosalind Franklin is uh, canceled for the moment. It's a joint mission of ESA and the Russian space agency Roscosmos. So ESA pulled the trigger on 25th of February to, due to reasons you all know. In two years, in the next Mars launch window, uh, MMX will start, which is a very um, nice mission that will investigate the bigger of the two moons of Mars, Phobos, with a lander and rover, 
and the rover will take samples and the samples will be returned to Earth. And uh, it has not so much to do with the search of life. It has more to do with uh, the fact that we don't know how the Martian moons came into being, how they, they got there, whether they are children of Mars, whether they caught uh, asteroids and so on. And since um, there are of course impacts on Mars in the billions of years since uh, Mars exists, there will also be some ejecta that will be sampled on Phobos and we be returned to the earth. So these will be the first samples from Mars via Phobos that will be returned to Earth and migrate into the laboratories. Our DLR Institute is uh, involved into five Mars missions, Mars Express I mentioned, then inside we bought a, a, a thermal probe that did, should penetrate into, uh, into five meters into the ground, which did not work so, so beautifully. <laughs> it got stuck at the surface. And uh, we are involved in the ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter, which also has a wonderful uh, camera system from Switzerland on board. We are involved in Perseverance. And of course, we have built a camera for the European ExoMars rover, the high resolution camera that maybe sometime will make it to Mars. We don't know at the moment when this will be. And here again, our we call the, the VW Beetle, the Volkswagen Beetle, er läuft and läuft and läuft. He's running and running and running. That was a slogan in the, I think in the 60s or 70s. And it's, it's really wonderful how this spacecraft was the first European planetary probe, how this spacecraft is still performing and will do so until the end of 2024. And I'm convinced we will, we will write proposals next year to extend the mission again. <laughs> There was a NASA buzzword, which was uh, follow the water for the missions I mentioned already, uh, because we know since the Viking missions in the, in the late 1970s that there was water running on the surface of Mars. Um, and so this has not to be proven again. So it's now that uh, the new missions are looking for signs of ancient life, biosignatures, and how this works, uh, I will explain in a couple of minutes. And as, uh, there was another, there were another two very successful rovers I did not yet mention because they are out of order now. It's a spirit and opportunity, and opportunity is, is really the, the, uh, the, the, the rover with the longest distance drive uh, in the solar system besides Earth, so Earth, of course. It was more than 42 kilometers. Sometime before, shortly before the end of the mission, it reached a marathon distance and it's, it's a bit, it, it went a little bit further and then it, it died two couple of years ago. Yeah, here we have it. Oh, I don't just wanna to spend too much time on this. Curiosity, of course, uh, it, it was a miracle in 10 years ago that this, um, Rover arrived in the in the Gale Crater at that time, which was uh, really fantastic, and and it, I, I can't believe that it's already ten years over again, and we will have one big uh, result in a, in a couple of minutes. I will I want to mention, and the other one was maybe, which is very important for human space flight. Um, there was. Uh, um, uh, an experiment on board that measured the radiation levels at the surface at the landing site. And uh, this, these radiation levels are higher than expected, meaning that future astronauts on Mars will have to be protected more carefully than we thought so far. Of course, you can spend 12 months on Mars uh, staying in your home, in your Coca-Cola tin can and uh, not going out. But of course, if you're on Mars with uh, astronauts and scientists and you want to want again get out and, and uh, collect samples and make field geology. And so the, the astronauts have to be protected for these field trips, for these extra, extra vehicular activities. This is a sketch of the Tianwen-1 spacecraft of uh, the spy, uh, Chinese Space Agency, CSA. And you see this man as a comparison for scale. It's really a big spacecraft and it's the first Mars mission that has three parts. 
namely an orbiter that had Viking 2, namely a lander, Viking 2 had this, and the rover, Viking did not have this. So it landed successfully in the, a little bit later than Perseverance last year in 21. And um, as far as I know, and I don't know too much about the mission, it's working really good because um, we have photographs from the rover from the surface, but I don't have scientific details. That's an image from before it arrived in February, approaching Mars. So the camera system on the orbit works. And this is these are images from the landing site on May 14, um, when it when the day when it landed. And this is a nice picture back from the row of, of, of its platform and showing that it's successfully driving down this ramp and being on the surface of Mars. And this here, one here is the control room of the Al-Amal, which means HOPE missions of the United Arabian Emirates that is uh, performed together with, I think it's two American universities in Colorado and in uh, Arizona. And you see the Arab dresses, so and you see the Arab the the, the flags on the, on the shelves of these um, tables. So this is a mission that leads into the future of these United Arabian Emirates because they all know that oil peak peak oil is coming in these decades, and uh, the societies have to prepare have to be prepared or. Um, this, the money earned will be spent for high technology and spaceflight is part of this. And so missions to Mars and to the moon and maybe to other targets will come from these nations too. So back to Mars, our target, you see nicely here that Mars is about half the diameter of the earth. You see the, the big differences, uh, the blue planet, the atmosphere, the clouds, the ice, polar ice caps, which are on Mars too, where you have a couple of geologic features that are very similar to, uh, to, to geological processes and features on Earth, but um, it's a much older surface uh, due to the plate tectonics I already mentioned. Plate tectonic changes the Earth's surface every hundred million years dramatically and in, uh, in billions of years completely. And, but what you see on Mars is something quite familiar to us. We have volcanoes, which are fed by magma from the inside of the planet, not today probably reaching the surface anymore, but our modelers in the geophysical department say there are still magmas probably rising under this one plate planet, this lid that's over the, over the mantle of of Mars. We have tectonic structures that uh, come along with volcanoes and, and volcanic evolution. And we have um, highlands in the south and lowlands in the north. We will see this in the next slide more, more uh, accentuated. And we have permanent ice caps at the poles in the North Pole and South Pole growing and shrinking with the seasons. The seasons are double as long as the seasons on Earth because Mars needs two years around the sun, the Earth only one year. And the axis of Mars is almost exactly as oblique as on Earth. So the seasons are almost precisely identical, but double as, double as long. And life, we don't see it from orbit. We don't see traces and um, we, we see only the traces of water and that's what it's all about. Here you see this topographic map of Mars that shows nicely the dichotomy, as we call it, of northern lowlands and southern highlands. The northern lowlands are younger, they have less craters on the surface, and the highlands have many, many, many more craters. So they, the highlands are more than 3, 3.5 billion years old, and the lowlands are the Amazonian age, as we call it. They are less than 3 billion, 2 billion, and 1 billion year old years old. The reason for the dichotomy is not so clear and uh, I don't can go into details. One of the theories is this Mars was hit, that Mars was hit by a big, big asteroid or protoplanet. And so a lot parts of the Northern hemisphere got cut away. And uh, uh, so, so there are topographically lower areas and the lower areas of course could be the places where 
standing bodies of waters, so seas and oceans existed when the water was running topographically downhill from the highlands into the northern lowlands. Just a short look at the biggest volcano in the solar system, which is Olympus Mons. It's uh, from the base about 21 kilometers high when you come from the lowest areas in the northwest and the southwest of, of the volcano it's even 26 kilometers high so really a giant and you see here the the, <coughs> the, the, the area of germany put over over the olympus mons area so it would be a volcano that covers almost uh, more than two thirds than of, of, of the land area of germany and it's really a giant um, a look into the atmosphere, which is very important uh, regarding life. A couple of numbers. You see it's a pure, almost pure carbon dioxide uh, atmosphere with 95%. That's the same as in Venus. And so the Venus has this atmosphere, Mars has this atmosphere. Where doesn't Earth have this atmosphere? Because we have, because we have life on Earth and <clears throat> photosynthesis that uh, pulls the carbon out of the atmosphere, as well as microorganisms that put the carbon in, in their skeletons and they die in the oceans and sink down to, to build uh, sediment layers that have been piled up then to mountain areas like the Bavarian mountains, like Mount Everest. So all the carbon is out of the, almost all of the carbon is out of the atmosphere of the earth. Of course, a little bit too much at the moment. Uh, which causes really hot summers these days. Um, the pressure is also important. It's less than a hundredth of the uh, of the atmospheric pressure, and then on Earth, uh, so it's really thin. And the temperature is that that's also the reason why the temperatures are partly extremely low, down as minus 130 degrees centigrade at the poles, and average it's about minus 60, minus 70 degrees which is not so favorable for life, but who's, who tells us that life has to be at the surface of Mars and not below the surface of Mars, where it's maybe a little bit more comfy. We have strong winds, even in a very thin atmosphere, which is also a factor that influences perhaps life. So we had these, these winds causes, cause storms and dust storms are a real problem for mission planning and mission operation. Uh, you can imagine that the fine grain dust powder can get into the mechanical parts and the electronical parts of any of these rovers or stations on Mars and uh, future, future habitats for astronauts. So you have to be careful with the dust storms on Mars as, as the Martian he taught us a couple of years ago in this movie, in this book. Okay, here again, this diagram with the composition of the three terrestrial planets, Mars, Venus, Earth, carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide, and nitrogen. A nice picture from our HRSC camera um, of an area near the North Pole, the crater Korolev, which is a seasonal ice-filled crater. So these ice caps are growing and shrinking to quite an extent from the North Pole to, uh, to our, towards uh, mid latitudes. And this is also true for the Southern Polar Cap. So there is some frozen water available for future stations on Mars, not only at the poles, but also in, in uh, areas near, near the equator, but there the ice is hidden under the surface several kilometers deep and but to quite a big extent, several hundred kilometer wide lenses of ice with maybe thicknesses of several tens of meters, which can, could be drilled and be used as fuel for the rockets returning to Earth and could also be used for human ex, uh, presence on life. Then we see the dendritic valley networks where water flowed more than 3.5 billion years ago on the moon. So we had a water cycle we had a, uh, on Mars. We had clouds, we had rain, we had uh, water runoff, we had lakes. We have, uh, again, the water going to the atmosphere, up in the atmosphere. So um, <clears throat> this is, was a, a time probably very favorable for the for the existence of life on Mars. And maybe it could have looked like this this time ago, 3.7 billion years ago, the artist shows a river that's running into a 
basin from an asteroid impact, forming a lake, you see clouds, you see rain, you see a volcano in the background. And this volcanic activity might be the trigger for some melting of ice in the subsurface, uh, which we see in some other places on the planet where, um, um, we, which we call chaotic terrains. I have this here on this slide, I can share this immediately. You see this chaotic collapsed areas in, in the, uh, under in the, in the lower edge of the of the image, which probably comes from ice filled cavities, which collapsed after the water was run off when it was triggered when the ice was triggered to melt and uh, flow away topographically to the northern lowlands. Um, so it could have be a time when when it looks like this on Mars, where we had more clouds from these clouds rain was falling the rain was running off to the northern lowlands and uh, combined with this chaotic terrains where a lot of water was stored probably we had a standing body of water and ocean in the northern hemisphere so not so unfavorable situation for life and we will see what happened uh, on other places we see we see um, sediments we see layers of sulfur bearing minerals which show us that these conditions changed dramatically to a more acidic environment and this acidic environment was probably going along with hydrothermal uh, activity in the in the triggered also by volcanism in in the subsurface and so this could mean that the about 3.5 billion years ago, when the climate changed on Mars, 3.6 billion years ago, that conditions for life were not so favorable anymore. Why did it change? Uh, we don't know it precisely. One, the, the most favorite theory is that Mars uh, lost his magnetic field, which it had at the beginning when um, um, iron rich magmas moved in its interior in the mantle probably also in, in the core like in, like on earth and so causing a ma magnetic field um, and this magnetic field felt uh, asleep when when these moving masses um, stopped moving in the interior of mars so the, <clears throat> the magnetic field did, could not shield the atmosphere anymore and so the atmosphere was uh, so to say, attacked by cosmic rays, by, by the solar radiation, by UV radiation, and H2O molecules got cut apart by, by this radiation. And the lighter hydrogen was lost to, to space and the heavier oxygen was oxidizing the rocks, the, 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 mineral, the, the iron bearing minerals in the, in the rocks on Mars. And that's why Mars looks so rusty and has this name of being a, a red planet. So, and as I said before, when, when the atmosphere be became thinner, it also became colder and drier on Mars. Today is Mars, Mars is completely dry and it's extremely cold. So the likelihood that we could have a brewery for our first astronauts on Mars is, is rather dim. So um, there's no water on the surface Although American scientists uh, every now and then thought they saw changes in images from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter in high resolution, where they saw changes and where something was running down uh, a slope, and they said this could have been water that was that was uh, <clears throat> running out of the, the walls of this of, of this uh, slopes, and uh, we are not so sure whether this is really the case because these color changes of these fans could also ca be caused by, by dry material. But that's, that's a scientific dispute which, for which we don't have to the time to talk about here. But um, Curiosity mentioned several times already in this talk, Curiosity found sediments and layers of on, and traces of an old lake in the crater Gale where it's cruising around and now climbing the, the mountain in the background uphill. And uh, it detected all the most important ingredients for life. So it's, it's carbon there, there's hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, there's phosphorus and there's sulfur. 
And uh, <clears throat> these are the most important ingredients for life and complex life on earth. So why should not nature have triggered the start of life on Mars? And that's at, at this point, are we at the moment we want to find out and we find, want to find the traces of life. So we continue this uh, dramatically expressed hunt for life now with a perseverance rover, which is the most sophisticated tool to find out. And there will be more to come. And uh, uh, I will explain what is what is about to come. Do you see also here this small helicopter ingenuity, which is not a scientific instrument. It's just a demonstration that you can fly in a thin Martian atmosphere. I will have a couple of slides about this, which is really nice too. Where did we land on Mars so far? It's mostly in a belt, uh, plus and minus 30 degrees latitude of the equator, because that's uh, technically easier and it's the temperatures are more moderate at night, which is very important for the electronics because uh, you have to keep it uh, higher than minus 60 degrees, uh, otherwise it would die down or you need have to heat it overnight. You only see the Phoenix mission from 2008 that landed in above 60 degrees north and the northern summer and uh, <clears throat> showed when it scratched at the surface that there was there was frozen water directly below the surface just a few centimeters deep and that uh, evaporated to, to, to the atmosphere at that time. You also see Mars 3 and uh, Mars 2 and Mars 6, which have been Soviet missions, which which failed, yes. Uh, there was only one mission, I think it was uh, Mars 2 that uh, transmitted, no, it was Mars 3 that transmitted for half a minute uh, parts of an image, but that image was never complete and you could not recognize anything on these images. And so the first landings on, Mar on Mars were Viking 1 and Ma Viking 2 in 1976. And they were really successful. And also with three experiments on each lander, that should uh, show or should uh, find out whether life existed or exists on Mars, rather exists, rather presence, because um, it uh, tried to find out traces of metabolism of, uh, of, of organisms on the surface of Mars. That was the initiative of Carl Sagan. And uh, all these two times three, six experiments were negative, although in some cases, there's still a scientific dispute whether there could not be a, 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 a tiny hint on life on for life on Mars. So they looked for a new landing site for perseverance, of course, and I just want to show you how this works. So the scientists introduce their ideas where it's most interesting drainage basins where water was uh, uh, in lakes. And then of course the technicians from NASA and JPL say plus or minus degree, not, not, not further north, not further south and a certain altitude is also important. And so at the end you have uh, 50, 60 landing site proposals. And one of them was uh, the Jezero crater in the ECDS impact basin because the, they detected a delta there, which has uh, very different sediments like uh, carbonates, which we have on earth, mag magnesium carbonates, like in the Dolomites where I spent last week, beautiful mountain area and iron and magnesium uh, um, clay minerals. You have olivine from uh, volcanic rocks, which when they come in contact also get to clay, decay to clay minerals. So it was very interesting. And so it was not a surprise that at the end, that's the matrix, how it was decided at the end, uh, the greener, the better. And of course, Chesero Crater was number one and Columbia Hills in Northeast Sirtis um, Desert was, was uh, on one of the substitute areas. Let's have another look into the, the um, Chesero Crater where you see this false color image of the deposits from this river that was ending in the crater and uh, where the different sediments have been deposited. And when you look at a delta on, on, on the earth, there's always a lot of biologic uh, load in, in, the, 
in the water. So it's very promising to go there. And when the analyst analyzed from orbit the Jezero crater, they saw all these different landscapes and rock types. So um, the task of perseverance is now to, to, <clears throat> to go to these places, to take samples and analyze it and have a look to, to the mission goal to fulfill it. The landing site was right in front of the Delta and they hit it quite perfectly. And NASA gave three main, main tasks for the mission. One is the, to determine the geology of the landing site and the surrounding. Then astrobiology, we will have uh, immediately look into this and sample caching, which was not the case before. So the first time uh, samples have been taken and will be taken again, the end of this year and next year and uh, will be deposited. Very interesting story. I come to this also in a minute, in a couple of minutes. And you see, prepare for humans. And of course, this expresses that the, the, the moment, the year is coming closer when we will send as mankind astronauts to the moon. So when you look at the circle of life on Earth, uh, uh, you all know that it started about three, more than 3.5 billion years ago with very primitive prokaryotes. And then it developed and developed and developed. Then came the Cambrian explosion, so to say, when uh, <clears throat> higher <clears throat> evolved animals and plants were covering all of the earth. And um, probably we have rather to look into early Mars history where we had this clim clim uh, climate change than at the younger places on, on Mars where probably the conditions for life have long been um, ago disfavorable. And so at the, at the beginning, of course, you look at old landings. Uh, when you look at the oldest rocks on the continents on earth, uh, the ocean floors are young anyway, you see that there are also only very few places left on earth that are older than 3.5 billion years old. And so the traces of the earliest life forms on earth are very rare. Only in these cratones that are gray colored, you have these ancient uh, <coughs> um, rock types where you find fossils uh, and traces of the earliest for life forms. So what have you, what, what have you looked for? Uh, when we go to Mars, we, we have no no geologists. Uh, we have we have uh, instruments on on the rover. So, are we really expecting to find classic fossils microscopically uh, detectable, so that the cameras can see it and make photographs of of leaves, like on the left side of this slide, or we find biosignatures of microfossils, like stromatolites, which we have also on Earth in Australia. I show you a wonderful example in the next image of fossilized uh, stromatolites, and then their extent is macroscopic. You see that the, the pen, and um, this is something that's not so unlikely because these have been archaean um, <clears throat> um, life forms, and these are still existing today. By the way, in the in Western Australia, in warm water environment but they are fossilized in Australia in this Pilbara region and they are about 3.5 billion years old. So this would be of course the, the best of all, all worlds for the instruments and the, the scientists um, for perseverance and, and the following mission. So that's why the, the science, parts of the science team went there to, uh, on an invitation of the Australian part, um, scientists to, to look what, what it really looked like. But you also can go into the microscopic scale. What you see here on the, uh, in the middle of the slide here, when you look for biominerals that are really small. And so the instruments have been designed to be able to detect something like this. Or you uh, check which isotopic composition and uh, relations of isotopic compositions uh, and concentrations you have in, in these rocks you analyze and you have to develop uh, instruments for this, or you go really into detail into the molecular um, level, basically, uh, for example, with Raman, Raman spectroscopy, uh, which is really able to detect uh, um, 
biomolecules uh, on a molecular um, uh, scale. We uh, know this because we have tested this on Earth. This is my colleague Jean-Pierre de Vera uh, in, on Antarctica, where he took samples from, from extreme of extremophile organisms. And these extremophile organisms have been investigated and in our laboratory in Berlin. And uh, this is not from Antarctica, this is from the from 4,000 meters altitude in the uh, Swiss mountains, where we have the highest existence of, of uh, these life forms that, that survive this very short summer and very long winter under extreme uh, temperature conditions. And you see these diodes, these uh, simulate the, the sun, and you see this red sand in, in the, in the in the sample holder. And so they checked in our laboratory whether these organisms not only survive, but also have metabolism. This is a big difference. We know from a lot of organisms on Earth when it's really dry or for more than one year, two years, three years in the deserts like Atacama and Death Valley, that, that they just stop doing metabolism and say, they, we wait for better times or whether they can uh, live really in this, under these conditions. And that's what was the case for these lichens and mosses and arcane bacteria and so on. So theoretically we have, um, we have uh, found, we have found out that life on Mars even today could be possible in ecological niches. And there's the thing with the atmosphere. Uh, there was with Mars Express uh, a very spectacular result in 2004 and five, when an instrument on the orbiter, a spectrometer, uh, found concentrations of methane, CH4, in the atmosphere and not evenly distributed, but uh, distributed over volcanic areas sort of or earlier volcanic areas. So there was the idea that this methane uh, which is a short-lived molecule, it uh, decays rather quick. So when you have methane in the atmosphere, you've got to have a source. So, and um, what these Italian scientists found out was that it was, uh, it could be of um, um, anorganic or organic origin, which is uh, of course not satisfying. Um, you know that methane in the Earth's atmosphere is coming from rice fields, from cows digesting the grass and so on. And that's what is in the lower left shown, that methane could come from there. And it could also be from the interaction of olivine rocks, uh, volcanic rocks with water. So, and then the gas is coming to the surface and can be detected uh, by instruments on as I said, the, the Mars Express trace gas orbit or, the, or MAVEN. And uh, unfortunately, to, uh, almost 20 years after this detection um, with the Mars's instrument from, from Italy, uh, they didn't found the uneven um, distribution. So it could be have a situation of luck 20 years ago when they dis detected this methane and that is destroyed already now again. They have smaller concentrations detected, but the, the methane case is not yet solved, so to say. Um, going not too long to perseverance. I, I'm doing it rather quick. I, I said that it's a really sophisticated machine with a lot of spectrometers that can uh, in, <clears throat> uh, investigate rocks from a distance with laser shots, so it's really, very science fiction like. It has wonderful cameras. I will show you the results or the images from the, from the cameras. It has a subsurface radar and it has an experiment called MOXIE. I explain at the very end of the mission because it has to do with astronautical missions to Mars. It has a weather station. It has microphones. It has a lot of cameras. It has better wheels than Curiosity. Curiosity's biggest problem is that the aluminum is was folded too thin. And so it has now holes in the wheels. And, and uh, that was avoided by thicker aluminum for the Perseverance wheels. 
Perseverance has 23 cameras. Uh, the most important one is the Mast Cam C, C for Zoom, which uh, can make 360 degree images from, from, the, from the area where, where it just uh, is in action at the moment. It has, has cams to avoid accidents on Mars. Maybe it will collide with Curiosity, but that's a couple of thousand kilometers away. So the danger is not too big, but rocks of course are danger. This is must come see, a uh, multi-spectral camera, a stereoscopic camera, and uh, it can zoom to the horizon, which is really wonderful, and can also zoom in the foreground and making almost uh, microscopic uh, scale images. I will show an, an example in a moment, and it's really wonderful. Um, yeah, it has scientific ob objectives. I don't want to go to, through all of those because we're losing too much time. Here's a wonderful picture of uh, the construction of the camera and you see the dimensions of it. And now that's Supercam. Sorry, sorry, it's not Mastcam C. I was just wondering, seeing only one, one lens, of course. It has, Supercam has one lens and, uh, and uh, it has this Raymond spectrometer on, uh, in, implemented with which uh, they can, uh, without destruction of the rock, they can analyze um, the mineral mineralogy and, of course, also bio biomolecules, which is um, <clears throat> a big progress towards uh, Curiosity's instrument. Then we have X-ray lithochemistry instruments that can uh, also detect biosignature by um, fluorescence, <clears throat> um, fluorescence, um, not emission, but uh, uh, it it ah missing the world. <laughs> yeah, it will. It it it, it beams a, a tiny spot on on the target rock and and is analyzing the induced X-ray fluorescence. Now that that was the word I was looking for. Sorry. <laughs> Then we have uh, Sherlock, that's also a very important instrument for detecting biox signatures. Yes, you see where it is. And we have the subsurface radar that's looking for water and layers and boundaries between layers of rocks was tested at uh, 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 Svalbard a couple of years ago. Then we have the Mars en Environmental Dynamic Dynamics Analyzer, MIDA, which is uh, uh, investigating the environmental situation of the atmosphere and so on. So a lot of, lot of instruments and it was all built together and launched and brought to Mars. And in February last year, there was this famous landing with a sky crane uh, <clears throat> from the descent stage of 11 meters altitude uh, safely on the surface. You see how this works here, this is more Astronautics, it's, it's wonderful to see it. And uh, I just show you a couple of pictures and I show you the, the tension that was of course, like, like always with a landing and an arrival of a mission at its target, it's, it's, it's almost unbearable. And the, the bad thing is it's always, it's, all, it's always over when you get the signal on earth because uh, the landing procedure though, uh, takes seven minutes seven minutes of terror as NASA says and uh, the, the signal comes after 11 minute, minutes to earth so no chance to do anything and you see with the corona masks that this also was taken uh, or has, has to be taken under control in these pandemic times when they couldn't sit close together at the control room at JPL in Pasadena and that's why they had a plate showing this pandemic or the this health situation on on Earth. This oh, ah, is what happened now. Sorry. I oh, hope you see a movie now. Support. Maybe you see. The it navigation has confirmed that the parachute has deployed, and we are seeing significant deceleration in the velocity. Our current velocity is four hundred and eighty meters. Heat shield up. Heat the shield has now slowed to off. subsonic speeds and the heat shield has been separated. This allows 
both the radar and the cameras to get their first look at the surface. Current velocity is 145 meters per second and an altitude of about 10 km, nine and a half kilometers above the surface. Velocity is about 100 meters per second, 6.6 kilometers above the surface. You see the delta? I hope you see it. Perseverance is continuing to descend on the parachute. We are coming up on the initialization of terrain relative navigation and subsequently the priming of the landing engines. Our current velocity is about 90 meters per second at an altitude of 4.2 kilometers. TRN safety, bravo. We have completed our terrain relative navigation. Current speed is about 30 meters per second, altitude of about 300 meters off the surface of Mars. Now you see the dust. We have started our constant velocity accordion, which means we are conducting the sky crane, about to conduct the sky crane maneuver. Sky crane maneuver has started about 20 meters off the surface. Now you hear the magic words. We're getting signals from MRO. Tango Delta. Touchdown confirmed. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking the sands of past life. Oh, it's always an incredible feeling to see it again. And this is the image from the last meters before the landing and here in the control room at the JPL where the NASA director has no access until the landing is over. <laughs> it's a tradition there. So they, they hit the spot they were targeting on almost perfectly. Uh, and what you see in the upper right is an image from 600 kilometers distance with a high rise camera on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Please, Uli, raise your volume a little bit. Your volume is low. Volume is low? Yeah. Irgendwie ist jetzt dein Lautsprecher leiser geworden. I don't know why this is the case. I'm talking the same. I have not, I haven't any. Jetzt, jetzt ist besser wieder, ja. Anything? Yeah. But now it's better. I'm talking louder a little bit. Okay. Yeah, as, as you see. Yeah. Uh, yes, better, better. Very much better now. The parachute and, and the landing uh, device is seen here from 600 kilometers distance. And when you look into the parachute, you might have been wondering about, about this crazy uh, pattern of, of the colors. And uh, you see it's, it, there was a message in this uh, that was telling the longitude and latitude of the entrance of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and the work their mighty things. Um, so this was the it is this was the buzzword for the mission for perseverance. Um, I just because we are running out of time, I show you I show you what happened with a helicopter that was really wonderful. There you see in the you see it in the air uh, on its uh, virgin flight on 19 April last year. And here see it, you see the diagram rise of three meters. 40 seconds and landing safely after a rotation of 90 degrees. The helicopter was at the base of, of, of the Perseverance rover. And you see it here when it unfolds and the rover of course was moving on top away and it was landing, standing on the surface. And here are the technical parameters. It's only 1.8 kilogram heavy and uh, <clears throat> has, has um, Blades that have been rotating with 2,400 rotations per minute. And they tested it years and years and years in Pasadena and in a, in a tank with Mars atmosphere and pressure. And then they, they succeeded about 100 times. And then NASA decided to take it with it, with perseverance to Mars to test it technologically. And what you see here is a uh, historical important <laughs> detail. It's, uh, it's a piece from the Wright Brothers airplane from 1904 when they had the first motor flight from the wings. It, it is the fabric from the wings they, that they put around one of the cables here so they did not increase the mass of, of the helicopter too heavy. Um, there's another movie here. I hope I get it running. Yes, it should be running. It's very, it's short, 
but it shows the, the helicopter ingenuity in the center of the base of the image. Now it's rotating. Of course, you need good weather conditions, not too, with too strong winds, then it's rising. And at the legs, you can see the rotation. Now, I see it now, you see it probably a couple of seconds later. So it rotated 90 degrees and it's standing stable in the air. And it will be landing now again after half a minute. It's going down. So the first successful flight on another planet in the solar system was performed. And of course, the flight team from the helicopter was extremely happy. And the flight director had a paper in her hand. She was tearing apart in pieces. That was what she would have told the public when it went, when it, it would have crashed on the surface. So that was not needed anymore. And the flight, uh, the, the pilot of the, of the helicopter, of course, has a traditional pilot look, um, uh, logbook. So, and you also could solve uh, boarding passes like, <laughs> like uh, Bernard is now used for its flight, for his flight to Italy. I want to show this image just uh, here towards the end of the talk that shows on one hand um, <clears throat> that there are always people behind this uh, metal stuff and machines and cables and electronics and computer programs. So it, it's, it's not the complete team because at that time of 2020, we, have, we, are, we are not allowed to fly to, to, to the US anymore. And uh, so this shows the team without us. So um, what's, what is Curiosity, uh, Perseverance are doing? I show you an example of, the free, of a 360 degree image mosaic, uh, which my colleagues here from DLR are helping um, to produce week by week and uh, you see that the single frames are recorded and that it's programmed that way though so that's uh, a little bit of overlap with every image so it can be stitched together looks wonderful at the end and uh, it, it needs some handwork too because of course there's there are always data that are not precisely the way they were expected so you have to look into the details but at the end, you have wonderful detailed image. Um, me as a geologist, uh, for me, that's that's really crazy. You can you can influence the colors uh, when you play with the filters a little bit. And as of today, we have uh, more than three hundred and eighteen thousand images recorded with perseverance and transmitted to Earth. No? In unbelievable and. That's one of my favorites here. The boulders at Santa Cruz. These are volcanic rocks. Here you see an image uh, or some images where, which show the dynamics in the local Mars atmosphere with uh, dust devils that are chasing over the surface uh, and taking dust into the air and transporting it. That was in July last year already. Here you see this example for zoom capabilities to, for close-ups, yeah, up to millimeter scale all these rocks, all these wonderful rocks. Yeah. Then of course the rover was moving after the landing. It, uh, the, the, the path was, uh, was chosen. Then uh, with, they had simulations with a twin perseverance rover in Pasadena in case something doesn't work. Um, I just show you a little bit of more technical details now. So <clears throat> then the, one of the most important things regarding the hunt for life, is the drilling of core samples on Mars. So with a, with a robotic arm, Perseverance can drill cores about the size of a chalk for the school. And, um, and they will be deposited in one of these, uh, three of these containers. At the end, it will be 36 um, samples taken from all these geological features I showed you uh, already before or as many as possible and in, in, different, in different combinations, uh, lake deposits, uh, volcanic rocks, um, <clears throat> and, and so on. And that started last year in September. The first, the first sample taken did not work and they were really shaken by this um, uh, unsuccessful try at the very beginning. But then they realized they could do it. 
And uh, now they have, I think we are at 20 samples. I have a slide that, that's explaining this. You see here the, the two drill holes for the sample three and sample three. We, we make the topographic models of these rocks. So the, the drill can be programmed accordingly. And at the end, uh, it will be filled. It's in, in this core sample, sample core, camp core sample hold holder. Yeah, here you see how it looks in these things. Here you see different rock types that have already been sampled. And so perseverance, where is it right now? We have um, um, one and a half year, we went about distance of several kilometers. And first they went here and took samples and helicopter flights. And then they took the long way around this ridge and are now looking at the front of the Delta. I have it in more detail in a minute. And uh, by the way, they found where the rest of the mission landed or crashed on the surface of the moon, the back shell and the parachute, uh, which of course should not fall on the landing rover because then the cameras could not work properly. And you look back on the rover tracks and here you see where Perseverance is right now. You see the scale of two kilometers on the left of the image. And it's now, now is the discussion where it's going on. We have already, uh, <clears throat> well, the helicopter here with its shadow and the base seen it's, has three, 30 flights. Only one flight was planned and it has 30 successful flights. It has always to follow the rover <coughs> because otherwise it could not, it could not uh, transmit its data to, to the earth. So it has to follow like a dog. And here you see the first sediments of the Delta feature. And you see an example of how the, the rocks are stored. And these are is spread, is, it, this, this board is already, it's, it's an old image. So it, it has, as I said, too much more. So the sample return will be very important for the success for the, of the mission and for the question whether there's life on Mars or not. It could be the case that perseverance detects biosignatures on Mars. Um, but even though it's the most sophisticated analytical gear that is on board, it's, much, it's, it's no comparison to when you return samples to Earth and investigate these samples in laboratories with dozens of scientists, PhD students, and again and again, and you make microscopic slices and, <clears throat> and you do different analysis methods and you repeat it after five years when you have a new instrument. So this return of samples towards the end of this decade and the beginning of the next decade will be a big, big progress in uh, answering the question whether life on Mars ever existed. So, so this, the, the idea is that what you've seen in the slide before, that the, these three containers will be uh, collected by a fetch rover. That was the original idea um, that the fetch rover is coming from ESA, but NASA is now thinking about whether Perseverance itself will, will um, be able to put the, the containers into this rocket that's, that will be going to orbit, you see in the lower right, and then the orbiter will bring the stuff home. Um, I don't go into details with this and uh, <clears throat> just want to stop with the perseverance part and only have a few slides left that show what we are doing, or what we hope, what we are doing soon with our ExoMars, Rosalind Franklin. The, the major difference is the drilling device. You see this black box in the front, which can drill cores from down to two meters depth, uh, which is uh, much deeper than Perseverance does, but it will not uh, collect samples to return to Earth. So it will analyze it um, right at the place where it is. Uh, you see the solar panels. Uh, Rosalind Franklin will get power by solar energy, whereas Perseverance has radio thermonuclear generators. And you might ask yourself, who is Rosalind Franklin? She was a scientist working in the 50s of the last century, together with Crick and Watson to analyze DNA structures in Great Britain. 
and it's uh, she died really young, as you see, with 38, and it's it's really she's honored with this with this device with this mission. Here you see the drilling idea, and here you see the camera on top, which is something we are proud of at DLR because the, this little green thing, uh, one of my colleague or two of my colleagues developed together with the retired Professor Yaumann in the last 10, 10 years to fly <laughs> Rosalind Franklin, which was supposed to start on September 26 this year and which is of course not the case. They tested it in, they tested it in uh, Lanzarote, desert-like environments. And me as a non-technician, I'm wondering how such a thing really could properly work in 50 million kilometer distance away. But it works, so <laughs> they tested it all. Um, the very end is what about astronautical, astronautical missions to Mars? This is uh, uh, not hunting for life on Mars, but it will be life on Mars. Um, you know, the situation is a bit unfortunate with today's rocket uh, technology. We need seven months to get to Mars because of the planetary constellation. Then we have to wait on Mars until Earth is coming back from behind because it's faster than Mars, then jump down to, to the Earth again. So it's uh, simplified. It's a, it said six months plus 12 months plus six months is 24 months is two years. And two years is a long time. So this will be perhaps the bigger problem than the technology to get uh, all these soft factors under control. Um, there are, I mentioned this MOXIE experiment at the very beginning that uh, you could use the Martian atmosphere to extract oxygen from the CO2. Um, and this MOXIE experiment worked very well. It was just a few weeks ago, a publication in Science or in Nature that proved uh, that, that uh, they, they produced several times a couple of grams of oxygen from the from the atmosphere, There's, they scaled it up and they say with uh, bigger instruments, it would be possible within the time that the, the crew of a Mars, Mars mission is on the surface to produce enough oxygen, both for survival of the astronauts and production uh, of the uh, O2H2 rocket fuel that is uh, commonly used for, for rockets, for, for some types of rockets. And so this would be working. And <clears throat> you see where the MOX instrument is, which is not so spectacular, of course, but you see preparations that humans try under Mars-like conditions to work in astronaut suits on the surface of, of, of the Earth. They have these different, different habitats uh, which would be a talk of its own, of course. And you have some people we all know who are very optimistic about Mars and like say like uh, they will bring astronauts to Mars in this decade, which is, I would say, very optimistic. So maybe it's, I have in mind a very famous person who also announced a couple of things. But the big mouth number one also performed perfectly. So yeah, it's not out of this world. And Ulrich Walter, a German astronaut says, uh, note the 2nd of August 48, then the first people will land on Mars. Um, it's, it's a bit, um, uh, it's not coincidence because uh, 2033 and 2048 are very close opposition uh, situations between Mars and Earth, so the distances are very, very small, just a little bit over 50 million kilometers, so you could uh, get more payload to Mars. So maybe even during my lifetime, I'm getting 60 next year, I will see people walking on Mars. This is a future <laughs> perspective 100 years from now. And you all know this person here, he was a big promoter of flying immediately to Mars um, after the end of the Apollo missions, or at least at the two, before the end of the last century. This is Buzz Aldrin. And so there are the wishing that, that this will happen. And, but Aldrin got a bit, little bit pissed by the slow progress and said, hey, you pro promised me Mars colonies. Instead, I got 
Facebook. <laughs> I end up here. Thank you. Thank you very, very, very much, Uli. Uh, it was really such an inform informative uh, lecture, interesting and full of information. Um, yeah, I always like your lectures. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I would like to mention all people who are in the chat. Uh, we have people watching from South Africa, from Turkey, from the United States, um, from Norway, from Alaska, from um, uh, yeah, this I cannot read. Uh, yeah, from several countries. So. Um, I'm really happy and um, I would like to forward uh, immediately the first questions from the chat. Um, and I have too many questions too. <laughs> yeah, I have some questions too, but first the chat, the chat. you know, first the chat. Please. Um, uh, Epico guy, <clears throat> sorry, is asking, what are the chances of finding life on Mars? Uh, I, I, think we, small. <laughs> yeah, I think we cannot, we cannot put this into numbers and say 20% or 40% or 80%, but um, we are optimistic that we would detect it if it ever existed on Mars, if it's not only one tiny place, of course, but uh, the places selected for these missions are all very promising. So if it would have been there, then we think with the instruments we have now on Mars and which will follow, we will detect life in this century on Mars. A fossilized life more likely than existent life, of course. Uh, Jay Lambert uh, is asking, can you comment uh, on some scientists uh, not being able to search for life where life may exist due to concerns of contamination? I know this problem exists. And if we are to send humans there, uh, should we not be aware ahead of time of the kind of microorganism that may exist on the sub subsurface water? And uh, the last question from him is, do any of the rovers process microbes uh, for analyzing samples? Uh, if not, why not? Oh, it's, these are very good questions because it's touching a, a very important issue when looking for, uh, searching for life on Mars. Um, you have to, first you have to take care that you don't bring stuff from Earth to Mars, which would which would falsify your result. All of a sudden you have, you have uh, uh, the proof, oh, we have found life on Mars and you, you find out <clears throat> it, was, it was unfortunately from the kitchen of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. <laughs> um, uh, <clears throat> so this is, uh, this is combined in the, in the buzzword planetary protection also for ethical reasons, uh, we should not spoil our neighboring celestial bodies with stuff we have we bring from earth for scientific reasons, but also for ethical reasons. And when you get sam the samples now back to earth, you have uh, the other way around, you have to take care that they do not get in contact with any air from, from the earth. So they would not uh, spread on, on in, into the Earth's, into Earth's atmosphere or would falsify your result here on Earth in the laboratories. So, and um, <clears throat> the, the third question was uh, when you, this is also, mm -hmm. yeah, this, um, it's, it's, with these missions, it's always that you have, uh, the maximum you have is 10% payload. So um, the proposals are, well balanced and uh, sometimes it depends whether it uh, the scientific results are promising enough that your experiment is selected and sometimes uh, it has to do with whether you get it ready so space space calibrated and uh, space tested space qualified and when the launch is scheduled and when you cannot guarantee this, then NASA says, unfortunately, we cannot wait for you. And the third, of course, is that you have the funding for, for, the, for these instruments. <coughs> <coughs> for example, when you have, when you have a, a fantastic new analyzing method, 
but it costs your, your, your local space agency 100 million euros, then your local space agency may say, oh, it's nice, but it's a bit too expensive. Mm. Uh, and uh, why the probes are uh, deposed uh, and why they co collect the samples, why they do not uh, take them uh, immediately with, uh, with the rover? Well, they have, they have to, to drive to different places and it takes some time. So, uh, of course, when you have place for 36 samples, you try to get as many different types of samples as possible. And this can mean that you come twice to a place where you say, oh, we had this before, so let's, let's select another place. And it takes another two months to get there, maybe. So that's, it's a, it, it, the group discusses this so extensively. I, I have seen, I've seen these discussions on, on Zoom and so on for several times. It goes for hours and hours and hours. <laughs> yeah, but I thought they, they could have uh, uh, developed a um, uh, behälter, jar, jar, or an, uh, a, container. A, a container. Container where they collect it immediately. Also, why to leave it uh, in the landscape and then to come back to come back to collect it? Because um, the mission that will uh, collect the samples and return them to Earth was not uh, developed uh, so far that. So time is not a critical factor at the moment. Okay. So they have, okay. they have to be ready at the end of this decade with it. So they have plenty of time. Okay. Hmm. Adriano? My turn for a couple of questions. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so uh, please correct me if I am wrong, but what I know is that we explored less than 1% of the Mars surface so far. Yes. With, with the different uh, probes and, and uh, rovers and so on. But uh, my question is, was that a good sample? Statistically, we could say that we, we have a good sample of the Mars environment, with, with, even with this very small uh, exploration uh, surface that we explored so far. Yes, I would say so, because you have... Uh... You have the geological uh, analysis from orbit. You have the geochemical and mineralogical analysis from, from free spacecraft with rather high resoluted uh, um, compositional maps. And uh, <clears throat> for, for example, for the landing site of, of Perseverance, they looked for five years into into mass reconnaissance images and, and the spectral data from Odyssey and MRO and so on, and said that this is a very representative place for a former lake that existed for a, lot, a longer time. The lake got two rivers that fed the lake and brought sediment load and maybe biological, bio, bio minerals, bio, um, uh, molecules in, into this pound. So we, it's rather likely that there these biomolecules are more concentrated than in a lot of other places. Um, I, I overlooked a an, 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 an yeah. question from the chat. Sorry, I didn't scroll. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, one for, one so, from me and one from the chat. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I take this from the chat and then you. Uh, could you provide a simple dust cleaning system for the solar panels on the new rover to clear off the dust which can accumulate, uh, for example, uh, motor and brush from the center of the panel? Yes, yes, that's, I, was, I was asking this same question when they now had now these problems with the, the inside solar panels um, <clears throat> that you don't have a brush or a fan or something that could blow away the, the dust. We, they had this problem before with Spirit and Opportunity that they uh, had dust on their solar panels and it was winter time, so the solar radiation was, was low anyway. And uh, actually, I, you, you have this, this problem perhaps again with, with an ExoMars rover, but you don't have the problem with, spirit, uh, with curiosity and perseverance because they have plutonium batteries. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, and, and the lenses uh, cannot be uh, uh, covered by dust? As far as I know, they are 
coated with uh, some anti um, so so that dust does not attach to the to the lenses and they can close it okay. they can, if there's really a dust storm they can close it okay Adriano? yes uh, so uh, as what we understand what we know in the atmosphere of mars there are there is a very very small part of oxygen that means that in, in the in the environment uh, there will there will not be any oxidation because without oxygen oxidation doesn't exist but mars is red that we, we can we can imagine that uh, there the, there are I, I don't know iron irony uh, uh, rocks uh, with the percentage of iron and that there there is rust uh, or or something like that so uh, was that a proof that uh, a different atmosphere existed once and 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 the water flowing and, and and so on that if we really if we have rust on mars that cannot exist now because we don't have oxidation Yes, we have. We had this this oxygen in form of H two O molecules, and uh, because we had much more water in the atmosphere, so and and um, that was at, at the part of of the presentation when I said that about, uh, about three point six billion years ago, the, the magnetic field died. So yeah. before that time, uh, there was much more oxygen in the atmosphere, in form of H two O. Then. The H2O molecules got split by solar radiation, and, and uh, so this is proof. This is proof. This history it, is proved. It's, it's, it's not an hypothesis. It's in the indirectly proved. It, it must okay. have been like okay. this. <laughs> okay. 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 Uh, to the magnetic field, I have also a question. Um, um, on Earth, uh, we have now uh, the change of the the poles as uh, the magnetic field. Mm -hmm. uh, can it be that uh, the environmental problems uh, we have here on Earth are caused uh, partly by, by the change of the magnetic field because uh, the Gulf uh, flu is inf uh, affected and uh, we have uh, the, the desert is wandering and uh, as a wandering and uh, as a moving. Um, can it be, and uh, can it be that we also will lose our uh, shield uh, protection uh, or atmosphere? Hmm? Of course, we are very vulnerable in this uh, moment, I guess. No, when, when the <coughs> yes, there are, there are two answers. One one is that uh, at the moment the magnetic field is still stable and not not changing and not weakening. Only the magnetic pole is migrating with, I think, two kilometers per year over the Canadian shield, which doesn't make, it doesn't cause any problems. What uh, we, then we know that we had these changes every several hundred thousand years, and it will be soon, soon can mean in 10 years, in 100 years, in 1,000 years, in 10,000 years, uh, we will have another change of polarity of, of the magnetic field. From the fossil record of the Earth, we know that there were no mass extinctions at that time. But what we don't know, because the last change of the magnetic field, uh, mankind did not yet exist. So we don't know whether we all have curls after that event or even worse than that. <laughs> it will certainly affect uh, um, satellites in the low Earth orbit and so on, but I'm not a, speci a specialist in this field. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, okay. My second uh, question is about CO2, that it also relates to. Uh, I'm coming from Mars to Earth in this in this case, uh, like uh, Sabine they, they, before. Uh, so it seems that we have a technology to uh, to get. Uh, water and oxygen from co2 because we can we can do it on mars to to produce water for to to drink and, and to use and also for fuel uh, for the uh, for the rocket fuel so my question is quite stupid and ignorant of course could we do the same because we have a redundant co2 on earth because uh, uh, we are producing too much of this thing and and uh, and so on, 
So uh, could it be possible to apply that technology here to get water and fuel? That would be great because we could uh, uh, avoid uh, using uh, uh, oil to produce fuel. Fuel, so so we, it would be a step over the um, uh, the fossil uh, uh, yeah. resources. Prin principally, yes. I don't know exactly about the energy balance, and I guess um, um, this the, the energy balance will not be really good here on Earth, and uh, is only applicable on on the moon at the craters where they have this water ice in deep holes at the crater north and south pole to make uh, 40 tons of say rocket fuel and 10 tons of drinking water and for the brewery on mars never don't forget to mention this <laughs> or good wine who knows um, <clears throat> um, and the the concentration of co2 that harms our terrestrial atmosphere at the moment is, is still very low. It's 0.04, or it's, it's really ex extreme. It's interestingly how low this concentration is. So the only way would be, of course, you take it directly from the, from the cows and so on. I, I have never thought about this, but uh, it would be, it's an interesting aspect, of course. Huh? Me as a geologist, I think it's more applicable to press to press CO2 into mines and, and caves of, of uh, salt uh, <coughs> plumes and so on, which is technically really easy, but it's uh, uh, pressing gases into the Earth's crust is always um, a political and societal. Yeah, issue. Well, okay, when, when you have it there, you can use it, why not? Yeah, that's that's my thought too. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. But we are not we, we are not following logical uh, roads. I, I think because uh, uh, everything is biased by ideological uh, um, movements and 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 uh, decisions and so on. Yeah. Currents yeah. of things, and yeah. of course there are there are interesting strains of reserves that nobody goes because they are not a fashion. Right sure. now, yeah. yeah, that's the point. I, 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 it's interesting this aspect. I, I try to discuss this with someone tomorrow, maybe. Yeah. Okay. So, more questions from your side. Yes, but uh, nothing more from from the audience. I wanted to read some comments only, but um, okay, yeah. okay. So I go on with the next one. Uh, how uh, many do you have? <laughs> no, it's almost <laughs> the okay. last one. Uh, okay, uh, I, I think I think you saw the movie, The Martians, The Martian. Yep. And, yes, and yes. Also, I also read the book, and perhaps you also read uh, the book by uh, Andy Weir. Um, and uh, some somebody criticized the movie uh, for uh, scientific inaccuracy, because in the movie it seems that the, the stormy, the, the dust stormy on Mars, uh, the wind was so strong. That was able to, to, no. to the, 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 the rocket in, in, in danger and uh, to, to reverse it and, and constrain it to. Uh, so, is, is, the, is the, incident, the accident that uh, began the, the, the adventure, okay? The, the, the rocket was constrained to, to, to leave, uh, leaving the poor guy <laughs> in, in the habitat, in the mass habitat, to culti try to cultivate potatoes and, and so on. Uh, so uh, they say that uh, uh, winds on Mars are not that strong. That's true. And, and so it, it, uh, the, the, this part of the, of the movie, because even even later when 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 uh, uh, the astronaut is uh, traveling by the rover to reach uh, the uh, yeah. the second point where there was a rocket, uh, uh, um, th there is a, a, another accident caused by the storm, by the, by the high wind, and so on. And so it, 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 uh, it is true then then that the wind could not be that strong and cannot make this kind of 
of damages. Of course, it can make other kind of damages, but not not uh, not to to put in danger uh, a rover or a, a, a rocket and, and uh, things like that. That's true. It is the wind. The winds are fast, but they are not strong enough to to transport metal plates. I think that was the, the, yeah. the which he was hit and uh, <clears throat> through the air. And that's that's true. That's it's. It's uh, inaccurate, and it's probably due to you need a story for this for the plot. <laughs> yes. So they invented this. Uh, but um, on the other hand, uh, the book was was che cheered by because Andy Weir did uh, ask a lot of people from NASA and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory with all these calculations: how much water would you need for the potatoes, and how much energy would yes. you need? And then you have dust in the atmosphere, so the solar panels reduce the power, so it, it will be. Will be again uh, a ride on the on, on the knife <clears throat> and so on, and um, it's 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 the, the winds are as strong, so they can transport dust, what we see also, which we already have seen with Mariner Four, but uh, it has all had it has difficulties to transport fractions of sand. We, we distinguish between dust, sand, uh, and so on. They, it's, it's, it has norms for, for the grain sizes and so on. And uh, even, even sand needs very strong winds on Mars to transport the, the sand grains. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> one more question by me. <laughs> uh, Uli, I thank you so much. Uh, Toma, uh, Priscilla Thomas uh, says, wonderful presentation, thank you. Uh, Jay Lamert says, excellent and interesting presentation. Thank you so much. And Ina Larsen's uh, from Norway says, uh, none of this is too expensive. This is one of the most important things for humanity. Though, so, um, <clears throat> thank you. Yeah, this may be another discussion we could open. Um, yeah, uh, thank you so much for this interesting lecture. It was really a pleasure to have you here, and I'm really grateful that you took yep, your time. Like yeah, yeah. Even, for me, even for me, it was very good, very nice. Uh, yeah, you know. Um, I, I know you, you can talk about other topics. Maybe next year we can welcome you again uh, as yeah, a guest yeah. speaker. <laughs> yeah, everything <laughs> one says yes. Um, we can conversate again in, in, in the future. Yeah, would you would you like to come next year? I don't know what next year is, but yeah, sure, I, you can. Yes, you can manage this. <laughs> this, this. This year is almost over already, so it's uh, no. I, and I I just returned from vacation and I looked into my calendar for the end of the year and I thought, oh my god, <laughs> oh yes, another year. <laughs> by, by, yes. by the way, I I just realized that the the nineteenth uh, of September. We will be in Paris, Sabine, at the IAC, uh, at the International Astronautical Federation Congress. Yeah. So I don't know, maybe we will have to postpone one week our next webinar. Because uh, it's this, for the 19th. Okay, we will. This we will see. Um, but what I also would like, uh, wanted to mention is uh, from the 20th uh, uh, to the 23rd of October, uh, who wants to know or learn more about Mars will take place the Mars Society Convention, the 25th Mars Society Convention in Arizona and the Arizona State University. And uh, it's always very, very interesting. And uh, there are many, many interesting lecturers. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so uh, maybe, uh, and uh, it will be also uh, virtual. So it's a present conference, but uh, now they decided uh, that they will also uh, give a virtual opportunity. as so you can still uh, register for the online uh, uh, yeah, way. Okay, thank you so much. I wish you all a nice evening. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for joining with us. And thank you for your lecture, Uli. Thank you for Bye. Yeah, Bye -bye. it was a pleasure. Bye-bye. Thanks, Atlas, for technical support.